Okay, so this is what the question says. It says a uh, playground, merry-go-round, oh, right? Uh, let me just uh, draw a top-down view. I have something that uh, round, like merry-go-rounds usually are. That has some mass, and it says it has uh, some radius r. Uh, I'm just giving letters to the quantities that are being given. And it says it's rotating with angular velocity of some revolutions per second. And even though they use the word angular velocity, it's actually frequency. It's angular frequency because I'm looking at revolutions per second. So this number has to be treated as a frequency and angular velocity will be 2 pi times the frequency. What this 2 pi does is it uh, converts the unit of revolutions into unit of radians, <laughs> neither of which are real units, but you just got to be careful when you're dealing with angular quantities. Um, what is its angular velocity after a child? And it's in revolution seconds, so it's asking for frequency after a um, child of some mass. Let me make my child green. Child of some mass gets onto it by grabbing its outer edge. Yeah. So the child will say gets on at the radius r. The child is initially at rest. So when you look at a question like this, the very first thing I want you to consider is whether conservation law strategy will work. Not because it always works, but because in cases where it doesn't work, it's usually easy to rule it out relatively quickly. So uh, I'm considering conservation law strategy. And at this point in your physics education, you've been only told about three conserved quantities. So it makes it extra easy. You've been told about energy or mechanical energy in this con class's context. And you've been told about momentum or now that we've introduced the rotation, linear momentum. And with the rotation in mind, we've introduced the angular momentum. So in this setup, um, so the first thing you should do is, are, is there anything in the setup that would make uh, conservation of any of these quantities not hold? When you're looking at mechanical energy, what you're looking for is, is there work done by non-conservative forces? And when you're looking at linear momentum, you're really watching out for external force. And for angular momentum, you are watching out for external torque. So as you ask these questions to yourself, I think one thing that um, can be challenging is uh, you don't hear words like friction or things that obviously sound non-conservative. So it's easy to miss this, um, which is that the question describes the situation that a child gets onto the merry-go-round by grabbing its outer edge. So what it is describing is it's describing a type of a sticking collision. Uh, two things um, that were moving at different speeds are brought together and then they stick and then move together at the same time. Um, and whenever you see that, I want you to automatically think of completely inelastic collision that we've covered in the past. So because of this description of two things sticking together, energy is not going to be conserved in this setup. So if you're tempted to use energy conservation, sorry, can't use it, even though it doesn't explicitly mention non-conservative forces like friction, the way the process is occurring indicates that it's a completely inelastic collision, so you can't use conservation of energy. So you might think, okay, it's momentum conserved. In a lot of completely inelastic collisions, you've seen momentum conserved. And here, what I'm gonna tell you is, you have to watch out for what's going on at the pivot, um, the thing that's holding the merry-go-round in place. And just uh, kind of playing this tape in my head, what I'm guessing is when the child grabs onto it, uh, they are applying a force, and in order to keep the merry-go-round fixed here, there's gonna be some force at the pivot. And that pivot force will make it so that moment, linear momentum isn't conserved. Now, angular momentum can still be conserved because whatever force is at the pivot point holding the merry-go-round, as, as, uh, um, as long as we are calculating the torque 
about this center of rotation, the lever arm for pivot force is zero. So we are going to use conservation of angular momentum. Once you've correctly identified the conserved quantity to use, then the first thing to, well, first, second thing to do is to, um, is to write the conservation law equation. So you say uh, total angular momentum before collision one is equal to total angular momentum after collision. Let's say snapshot two. So in snapshot one, we just have the merry-go-round, nothing else moving. So the total angular momentum there would be, uh, I'm thinking in terms of analogy, the momentum is given by mass times velocity. So analogy to that is angular momentum is given by rotational analog of mass, rotational inertia, rotational analog of velocity, angular velocity. So that should be the expression for angular velocity. So I say um, the rotational inertia of merry-go-round times angular velocity of merry-go-round initially, uh, plus the child has no angular momentum, so zero. That should equal the final angular momentum. And since it's a sticking collision, it would be natural for us to describe uh, some kind of a final total rotational inertia, merry-go-round plus the child, and some sort of final angular velocity. So looking at this, I think I'm given all the information necessary, go necessary for rotational inertia, so just to write it out. So playground, merry-go-round, it's a kind of a disc looking thing. And I guess uh, it's reasonable to assume that it's a uniform disk. Then um, we can say the rotational inertia of uh, merry-go-round is one half times its mass times the radius of the disk squared. It's one of the formulas you can look up in your textbook. Um, and the rotational inertia of the child, uh, we can treat the child as a point mass just being at this point, that distance r away. In that case, it will be the mass of the child, lowercase m, times the distance from the center of rotation squared. So the total here would be, uh, I think I just had to write it out, yeah. So I can treat all the rotation inertias as given quantity. They are in terms of the quantities that are given. Um, angular frequency of merry-go-round, I can calculate it from given frequency. Um, so I think all I have to do is solve for the angular frequency of the um, angular frequency, uh, the, the final angular frequency. So let me do it this way. I'm going to just do everything in Sage math. Let me declare my variables. Uh, it, rotation inertia of uh, merry-go-round, uh, angular velocity of merry-go-round, and because I did frequency of merry-go-round, and I need the rotation inertia of child, and I need a final angular velocity, and because I'm going to need the frequency eventually, uh, final frequency. Um, oh, and I need the mass of the child, uh, mass of the merry-go-round, radius of the merry-go-round, and mass of the child. That's everything. All right, we'll say, um, we have a uh, equation of uh, I merry-go-round times omega merry-go-round plus zero is equal to I merry-go-round plus I child times a final angular uh, velocity. And because I'm feeling extra lazy, I can just uh, have Sage Math to solve it. I mean, it's so simple that I don't really need to, but <laughs> I can. Nothing stops me from doing that. Um, so yeah, that's the solution. Let me just put the zeroth element of that as my solution. So okay, uh, let's just plug in the numbers. Uh, this is really the step I want you to do in Sage Math so that it, it can be done efficiently and in an easy to explain way. So I can substitute in expressions. I have expression for merry-go-round, that's uh, one half times mass times r squared. I have expression for rotation inertia of child, that's 
lowercase m times r squared. Okay, let's see what looks like after that. All right, I got a bunch of expressions. And I don't have um, omega m. What I do have is um, uh, uh, angular frequency. So I can say omega m is equal to uh, 2 pi times uh, fm. All right, good, good. And um, yeah, let's plug in all the numbers. And this is a slightly roundabout way to, of doing this than I normally would do, but let me just do it that way. So having done it this way, let me substitute in all the values. So we have um, the mass of 90 kilograms for the merry-go-round. We have its radius of 1.8 meters. We have the, the angular, uh, freq not angular, frequency <laughs> of um, 0 0.5 revolutions per second. That's the basic SI unit. So we'll say that's the frequency of merry-go-round. Um, we have mass of the child, 22 kilograms. I think that's it. Let's see. Ah, yeah. So I have an answer for omega f. Now, the, the, the um, thing is, let me do it this way. Um, I think I can get the right-hand side and put it uh, through the uh, omega f number. Yeah, so that's the angular frequency after collision. So now if we put this in, it'll say it's wrong because this is in radians per second. I have to convert it to revolutions per second. There are two pi radians in one revolution. So I need to take this divided by two pi so that uh, numerical approximation so that it'll give me uh, the answer in revolutions per second. So 0 0.336 revolutions per second. That's lower than that, seems reasonable. So yeah, that's how you do this question. Once you figure out what kind of quantities are conserved in this setting, then the calculation itself isn't that hard. It's really the hardest part is uh, understanding the setup and figuring out uh, what's conserved, angular momentum, and what's not conserved, mechanical energy.